All right. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and start. Uh, thank you all for coming. We're privileged to have a wonderful guest today who will be introduced by my fellow board member, Sarah Atwood, in just a moment. My name's Tyson Gaskill, and I am the current president of the Ruskin Art Club, which has been celebrating and, an and analyzing, or not, Ruskin's thoughts and writings since 1888. Uh, this is our first event of the calendar year. Today, we'll, we will be talking about Ruskin's views on the Renaissance. And as always, he has so very much to say, and he does it eloquently, whether you agree or disagree with him. Uh, we spent some time last summer going through the chapters uh, that he wrote on the Gothic, which I think he felt was the pinnacle of artistic achievement. In a good part, that was because mankind was honoring God, not himself. And by the time of the Renaissance, that had shifted and vainglorious tributes became all the rage. Um, so like nearly everyone else, I'm sure I'm, I'm a fan of Renaissance art and have had my breath taken away in the Vatican and many other churches and museums. Uh, Ruskin derided parts of the Renaissance. And if you know, you'll allow me to just paraphrase of, of something from the Stones of Venice, he declared that Raphael's work in the Vatican was the highest perfection of which the Renaissance was capable, but that it may be generally described as an elaborate and luscious form of nonsense. It is almost impossible to believe the depth to which the human mind can be debased in following this species of grotesque. It is an unnatural and monstrous abortion. Now that's a take on the divine Raphael that you will not often hear. Uh, so I look forward to hearing more. I, 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 I'm going to be a student here as, uh, along with the rest of you all. Um, but to properly start things off, please welcome with emoji hand claps, Sarah Atwood. She's uh, published widely on Ruskin and his contemporaries. She's the joint North American uh, Development Director of Ruskin's Guild of St. George. She's a companion of the Guild and a lecturer in English. Le she's a lecturer in English literature and writing at Portland Community College. And after the talk, we'll, we will have some time for questions. Sarah, please take it away. Okay. It's nice to see everyone this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, and especially to Jeremy for joining us as well from York. It's his evening, our morning. So we're having, again, you know, we're joining the two shores together. And we're happy to have him here for the first time and to start off this calendar year of events. Jeremy is a historian of modern art and criticism who has published widely on figures such as John Ruskin, Walter Pater, Pablo Picasso, and Lee Bontecou. He's completing a book entitled The Invention of Botticelli and is at work on another concerning Ruskin and the historical study of art. Previously, he was a fellow at the Center for the Theory and History of the Image, University of Basel. And in, just in January, he began a new role as lecturer in history of art at the University of York. So he's settling into his, his new role and his soon, soon his new digs when he finds a place, as he said this morning, um, as we speak. Um, so we're extra pleased that he's come to join us in the midst of all this change in his own, his own life. So I now want to turn over to Jeremy and um, thank you all again for being here. Hello, everyone. Um... Thank you so much for that uh, invitation or introduction, but also for the invitation to, to be here. Um, it's a great pleasure. I guess I first heard about the Ruskin Art Club when I was a graduate student um, studying for my PhD at UC Berkeley. And, um, you know, I became sort of interested in like what this interesting organization was and um, with such a fascinating history. So it's a really special pleasure to be able to join you um, this morning. Uh, this evening here, of course. Um, I'm just going to uh, dive in and let me share my screen now. Okay, hope that's visible to everyone. Um, today, um, I want to think again with you about John Ruskin's engagement with Italian Renaissance art. Uh, and in particular, I want to bring into focus several moments in which Ruskin had the courage to trust his own aesthetic responsiveness, opening himself to extraordinary artistic achievements that lay somewhat outside the expected bounds of his professed taste, uh, especially as that taste was developed early on. 
For Ruskin's um, usual hostility to Renaissance culture is well known, and we've heard a little of that already in the introduction. <clears throat> Denunciation of its pomp, scientism, and what he called its enervated sensuality gave moral urgency to the analysis he undertook in the Stones of Venice, for instance, with its powerful, overarching narrative of social and spiritual decline. Such principled misgivings about a historical formation that Ruskin understood to mark the tortured beginnings of everything that was bad about modernity um, characterized his attitudes to Renaissance paintings too, uh, at least early on. Uh, and given that I will be focusing on some of the exceptions um, to that in what follows, um, his baseline of negative judgment might as well be faced head on. Um, in addition to being addressed in the Stones of Venice, um, Raphael's Vatican frescoes um, uh, also appeared in a lecture on pre-Raphaelitism uh, from about the same moment, 1853. Um, and I'll quote from it now. In his 25th year, Ruskin writes, Raphael was sent to Rome to decorate the Vatican, having until that time worked exclusively in the ancient and stern medieval manner. On the wall of that chamber, he placed a picture of the world or kingdom of theology presided over by Christ. And on the side wall of the same chamber, he placed the world or kingdom of poetry presided over by Apollo. And from that spot and from that hour, the intellect and the art of Italy date their degradation. He elevated the creations of fancy on the one wall to the same rank as the objects of faith upon the other. <clears throat> the, um, the doom of the arts of Europe went forth from that chamber and it was brought about in part by the very excellencies of the man who had thus marked the commencement of decline. The perfection of execution and the beauty of feature which were attained in his works and in those of his great contemporaries rendered finish of execution and beauty of form chief objects of all artists. And thenceforth, execution was looked for rather than thought and beauty rather than veracity. So this turn from <clears throat> faith to fancy, truth to empty beauty, stern simplicity to narcotic luxury, um, this all describes the shape of Renaissance decline, at least as Ruskin understood it early on. Characteristically, he gives the transition a highly particularized form. The world historical transformation comes to be embodied within a single fresco program. Ruskin fixes on individual works, loading them with significance, partly, of course, for rhetorical and pedagogic effect. He wants to provide his audience with memorable objects to hold on to. But the habit of thought also, I think, opens onto more primal compulsions on the critic's part. It dramatizes Ruskin's own capacity to be gripped by things, his experience of compelled attention to the particularities of the world. This included even uh, the experience of being gripped by the supreme ugliness of Renaissance art. Um, and here he kind of extended beyond uh, Raphael's beauty. In places, for instance, the final volume of the Stones of Venice from 1853, entitled The Fall, reads like a hellish walking tour through the city's degradation. It is as if in his fury at the onset of modernity, Ross Ruskin asked his readers to linger stone by stone over what the foul torrent of the Renaissance, as he sometimes put it, had finally wrought. From the monstrous church of the Ospedaletto on the screen, um, the sculpture on its facade representing masses of diseased figure and swollen fruit, he says, to churches that are by turns clumsy, impious, and ridiculous, we arrive at last at Santa Maria Formosa, the most foul. And here I quote, in the 1730s, Canaletto, sorry, I'm not quoting, this is me. In the 1730s, uh, Canaletto had depicted the church from across the piazza before it, its Renaissance facade meeting our gaze. Ruskin, however, asks you to come at the church from its side, across a tiny footbridge from the direction of St. Mark's, and he says, to look at the head that is carved on the base of the tower, 
still dedicated to St. Mary the Beautiful. A head, he says, huge, inhuman, monstrous, leering in bestial degradation, too foul to be either pictured or described, or to be held to be beheld for more than an instant. Yet, he goes on, <clears throat> let it be endured for that instant. For in that head is embodied the type of the evil spirit to which Venice was abandoned in her decline. And it is well that we should know, that we should see and feel the full horror of it on this spot and know what pestilence it was that came and breathed upon her beauty. Ruskin describes the face here without fully describing it. His circumlocution holds us there, dilating the moment beyond which the monster cannot be endured. His text carves out a space in which the fiendish, fiendish image resonates and in its very evacuation from attention still manages somehow to hold sway. Even here in extremis, the presence of the object, unpicturable, indescribable, demands our vulnerable presence in its vicinity, a thing to be hated or feared fully at least, if it can't be attended to with love. Now, for all of their strange intensity, such passages ultimately offered confirmation of Ruskin's existing predilections for medieval work, bringing the foulness of the Renaissance into view. And yet Ruskin's romance of the particular could also turn the other way. It could lead to surprises and revisions within his developing sensibility, upheavals in what, he, what had already come to seem the stable ordering of his early writings aesthetic regime. As Ruskin himself suggested in Modern Painters uh, Volume 2, <clears throat> true taste, and I'm quoting, is forever growing, learning, reading, worshiping, laying its hand upon its mouth because it is astonished, lamenting over itself, and testing itself by the way that it fits things. I'm just gonna, yeah, take that off the screen. <clears throat> Within this uh, continual experience of astonishment, something new could emerge as seeable for Ruskin, initiating new modes of interest and thought. Such encounters were experienced as contingent by the critic, and accordingly, my account of them proceeds uh, uh, episodically. But certain themes recur, announced already in the divided loyalties that marked Ruskin's medievalism uh, in his early studies of Italian art. On the one hand, during his tour of Italy in, in 1845, Ruskin was immediately drawn to the sweetness and austerity of Fra Angelico and painters like him, the embodiment of a pious late medieval ideal. But on the other hand, there was from the beginning Tintoretto, before whose acres of canvas in Venice, Ruskin felt utterly crushed to earth. According to the timeline that would later be formalized in the Stones of Venice and elsewhere, the chronology simply couldn't add up. The great age of Venetian painting like Tintoretto's came too late decidedly after the fall. And yet achievements such as Tintoretto's, soon to be, going, too soon to be joined by um, what he called Veronese's magnificent animality could hardly be denied. So what was the committed medievalist to do? Notebooks and letters um, from the time, that is 1845, attest to the impact of encounters with what he called the real genius of Tintoret. A presentation of the Virgin in the Church of the Madonna dell'Orto leaves the young, young critic startled. A last judgment from uh, in the same church strikes him as differing, he says, entirely from the type of the subject adopted by the older painters. For in Tintoretto's conception, no emotions are represented, nothing but the great sensation of reawakened life. Uh, and here's a further detail of it from the from the lower register. This emphasis on sensation continues as he writes to his father about a visit to the Scuola uh, de San Rocco um, with his drawing teacher of the time, J.D. Harding. I have been quite overwhelmed today, he says, by a man whom I never dreamed of, Tintoret. 
Harding has been taken as uh, been as much taken aback as I have, but he says he has crumbled up while I feel encouraged and excited. I never was so utterly crushed to earth before any human intellect as I was today before Tintoret. He took it so entirely out of me that I could do nothing at last but lie on a bench and laugh. The modes of reaction that Tintoretto elicited from Ruskin would become mainstays of his aesthetic vocabulary. Feelings of being crushed, beaten, or defeated before works of art become regular testaments to their uncanny power. Ruskin's experience of rapt humiliation providing a measure of their overwhelming strength. But notice also the way in which being crushed here becomes an enabling experience for the critic. He's encouraged and excited by the good art. The breakdown of aesthetic self-assurance allows new capacities to emerge. In retrospect of this whole early experience concerning Tintoretto came to center on the great San Rocco crucifixion finding its first formulation as um, the literary critic David Russell has suggested in the pages of Modern Painters II from 1846. The terms of uh, Ruskin's analysis would prove prescient. He admires the way that Tintoretto avoided what Ruskin took to be the errors haunting previous depictions of the crucifixion, even those by artists he admired like Fra Angelico. In the common treatment of the subject, he says, the mind is either painfully directed to the bodily agony, coarsely expressed by outward anatomical signs, or else it is permitted to rest on that countenance inconceivable by men at any time, but chiefly so in this, it's consummated humiliation. But Tintoret here, as in all other cases, penetrating into the root and deep places of his subject, despising all outward and bodily appearances of pain and seeking for some means of expressing not the rack of, rack of nerve and sinew, but the fainting of the deserted son of God, has on the other hand filled his picture with such various and impetuous muscular exertion that the body of the crucified is by comparison in perfect repose and on the other has cast by the countenance altogether, uh, has cast the countenance altogether into shade. But the agony, he goes on, is told by this and by this only, that though there, were yet, though there yet remains a chasm of light on the mountain horizon where the earthquake darkness closes upon the day, the broad and sunlight glory about the head of the Redeemer has become wan and of the color of ashes. So Christ's suffering figure at the very center of the painting undergoes a double displacement in Ruskin's account. Bodily sensation is understood to radiate outward, draining away from his person to emerge instead within the muscular exertion, as he puts it, of the figure surrounding him, torturing and mocking him and raising up the other crosses. Despite themselves, these figures somehow become part of Christ's collective body in this account. And in a further displacement of unimaginable of feeling away from Christ's downturned face, the whole of the sky surrounding his countenance, the whole of the picture's atmosphere, gives form to Christ's agonized humiliation. And moreover, were this not enough, Ruskin himself affects another kind of spatial shift in the picture, uh, picture's meaning as he draws attention to what he calls a master stroke, just behind and to one side of the central crucifix. And if you if you can see my cursor, uh, he's gonna be pointing to this uh, donkey um, and, and the figure um, uh, riding it. And there they are in detail, just to the left of the crucifix. He redirects uh, attention um, to a perspectively diminished donkey just to Christ's right, an ass he says, feeding on the remnants of withered palm leaves. Chewing the detritus of Palm Sunday, it recalls the events of only five days before when the same populace now attending the crucifixion full of rage and disappointed pride had previously celebrated the King of Zion's entrance into Jerusalem, riding upon a mass. Narrative time both expands and collapses in this telling detail for Ruskin, deepening the painting's significance. 
Here we see, he says, the peculiar power of Tintoretto's imagination, once again, in the elevation into dignity and meaning of the smallest accessory circumstance. Both these attributes of Tintoretto's practice, his totalizing compositional power and his attention to the smallest detail become crucial to Ruskin's understanding of Venetian painting at its height. We can see this best, I think, in his extensive engagement with Veronese um, as it unfolded in, in the later 1850s. Ruskin studied several of uh, Veronese's paintings closely in Dresden during the summer of 1859, during a tour of German galleries. And before the Madonna of the Cucina family of about 1571, especially, he stood transfixed. His description of it, which I take to be one of the most compelling accounts of a picture that he ever wrote, would flow across several pages of a chapter called The Wings of the Lion, in Modern Painters, Volume 5 of 1860. The chapter presents a speculative cultural history of Venice and the formation of the Venetian's character, um, a seafaring people shaped by their immediate environment, their wave training and ocean work, as he puts it. The account of Veronese's painting arises out of a point concerning the worldliness of religious painting and the Serene Republic, and sinks away into another concerning the importance of what he calls the trivial or even ludicrous detail, what he elsewhere in Modern Painters 5 calls the task of the lease, um, exemplified here by the Venetian love of little dogs, um, though we might think again of Tintoretto's ass. Throughout the rest of Italy, Ruskin writes, piety had become abstract and opposed theoretically to worldly life. At Venice, all this was reversed and sold so boldly as at first to shock with its seeming irreverence, a spectator accustomed to the formalities and abstractions of the so-called sacred schools. The Madonnas are no more seated apart on their thrones. The saints no more breathe the celestial air. They are on our own plain ground, nay, here in our houses with us. In its very beauty, Ruskin thought, such a new balance was fragile and almost bound to fail. Its achievement, he thought, ultimately proved reckless. Titian's assumption of the Virgin, he writes, is a noble picture because Titian believed in the Madonna, but he did not paint it to make anyone else believe in her. He painted it because he enjoyed rich masses of red and blue and faces flushed with sunlight. However devout, the Venetian painter, he says, did not desire the religion, he desired the delight. And so, Ruskin concludes the chapter, I know not whether in sorrowful obedience or in wanton compliance, the great Venetians fostered the folly and enriched the luxury of their age. This only I know, that in proportion to the greatness of their power was the shame of its destruction and the suddenness of its fall. Ruskin's judgment is arresting, to say the least, in its severity. But his close description of actual pictures suggests a more nuanced story, I think, one that found other ways to keep the essential vulnerability of the Venetian enterprise in mind. Veronese's, uh, Veronese's painting had been commissioned by the immensely wealthy Cucina family originally from Bergamo, one of the most prominent merchant families of 16th century Venice. In a very 19th century way though, Ruskin took the painting to show Veronese's own family as painted by himself. The exact identification may be less important though here than the painting's complex pictorial structure as it gets fleshed out within a depiction of familial ties. Already um, several years before in Modern Painters, Volume 3, 1856, Ruskin had taken Veronese's greatness to lie in his powerful relational sensibility, his concern with forging tenderest balance, as he put it, between a painting's part, noting in each hair's breadth of color, not merely what its rightness or wrongness is in itself, but what its relation is to every other on the canvas. By such careful means, Veronese, he goes on, chooses to represent the great relations of visible things to each other, to the heaven above and to the earth beneath them, 
all joined in one great system of spacious truth. In the Kuchina family, I think, those great relations come wonderfully down to earth. The sacred group at the painting's left is fascinating, but Ruskin dispenses with the Madonna and saints in four quick sentences, ignoring the angel altogether. Even the figure Ruskin takes to be Veronese's self-portrait, um, this guy, the bearded man, leaning to his side behind the column, flits by in an instant. He himself stands a little behind, his hands clasped in prayer. That's it. Attention falls instead, falls lavishly on the intricate web of spatial and emotional relations that constitute the family group itself, gathered together under the canopying attention of the three virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And I'm going to read a longer quotation now. His wife, Ruskin says, kneels full in the front, a strong Venetian woman, well advanced in years. She has brought up her children in fear of God and is not afraid to meet the Virgin's eyes. She gazes steadfastly on them. Her proud head and gentle self-possessed face are relieved in one broad mass of shadow against a space of light formed by the white robes of faith who stands beside, guardian and companion. Perhaps a somewhat disappointing faith at first sight for her face is not in any special way exalted or refined. Veronese knew that faith had to companion simple and slow-hearted people, perhaps oftener than able or refined people, does not therefore insist on her being severely intellectual or looking as if she were always in the best company. So she is only distinguished by her pure white, not bright white dress, her delicate hand, her golden hair drifted in light ripples across her breast, from which the white robes fall merely in the shape of a shield, the shield of faith. A little behind her stands hope. She has a black veil on her head. Then again, in the front is charity, red robed. She has got some work to do even now, for a nephew of Veronese's is doubtful about coming forward and looks very humbly and penitently towards the Virgin his life perhaps not having been quite so exemplary as might at present be wished. Faith reaches her small white hand lightly back to him, lays the tips of her fingers on his, but Charity takes firm hold of him by the wrist from behind and will push him on presently if he still hangs back. The passage, the extraordinary passage, <clears throat> shows Ruskin luxuriating, I think, in his special capacities as a writer. It is this kind of looking with its gentle force that he is best at. In elaborating the connections between figures in the painting, describing the ways that come together before us, Ruskin also models how their larger significance might be drawn out. He slows our looking down, encourages us to follow the directions his attention takes, eliciting dynamic meaning from supposedly static forms. Such narration of the image opens seamlessly onto interpretation, it seems, based on close discernment of detail. Each figure comes into focus, but only within attention's movement from one form to another, as it follows the vital network of feeling that threads through them, a tissue of touches and glances, anticipations and apprehensions, which individual figures articulate between themselves, semantic and gestural at once. The enveloping choreography of the virtues cons constitutes one such structure. The internal balancings of the family members gives form to another. Um, and here I continue with the quotation. In front of the mother kneel her two eldest children, a girl of about 16 and a boy a year or two younger. They are both wrapped in adoration, the boys being the deepest. Nearer us, <clears throat> at their left side, is a younger boy, about nine years old, a black-eyed fellow, full of life, and evidently his father's darling, for Rut Veronese has put him full in light in the front and given him a beautiful white silken jacket barred with black that nobody may ever miss seeing him to the end of time. He is a little shy about being presented to the Madonna, and for the present has got behind the pillar, blushing, but opening his black eyes wide. 
he is just summoning courage to peep round and see if she looks kind. A still younger child, about six years old, is really frightened and has run back to his mother, catching hold of her dress at the waist. She throws her right arm round him and over him with exquisite instinctive action, not moving her eyes from the Madonna's face. Last of all, the youngest child, perhaps about three years old, is neither frightened nor interested, but finds the ceremony tedious and is trying to coax the dog to play with him. But the dog, which is one of the, of the little curly, short-nosed, fringy-pawed things, which all Venetian ladies petted, will not now be coaxed. For the dog is the last link in the chain of lowering feeling and takes his doggish view of the matter. <clears throat> the mixture of tenderness and humor here, so characteristic of Ruskin at his calmest, stages the interwoven nature of the painting's compositional work. The feeling is the form. What matters is less the firm definition of emotion or atomized identity than the way in which those identities become just fixed enough to articulate their blending together. They describe a larger dynamism, a relay across the whole. And it is utterly typical that Ruskin should offer, an, offer us an interpretive key on the sly. The little dog with his doggish view seems to propose an exit from the charmed circle of the painting. He cannot understand, he says, first, how the Madonna got into the house, nor secondly, why she is allowed to stay, disturbing the family and taking all their attention from his dogship, and he is walking away much offended. But in thus turning away, he lights the whole network of affection up, flipping like a switch. As the last link in a chain of lowering feeling, he shows definitively that feeling to be enchained. That word lowering, <clears throat> chain of lowering feeling, of course, raises questions of hierarchy already implicated in the whole concept of the family. Such inequality has often posed difficulties for readers of Ruskin, especially given the complexity of his politics. And to some extent, it is simply a matter of critical temperament, whether one wishes to emphasize enchainment and connection here, or the relative standing of each link within that chain. But nonetheless, I do want to follow what I take to have been Ruskin's intuition as he studied the painting up close, that it is made up of hierarchies, joints, unequal configurations, yes, but that the painting also works hard, which is to say works gently, persuasively, to bring things together within its lateral expanse. Boundaries are there, yet it is also as if they might always be under construction, breaking apart and reforming into other articulations before our eyes. The tangled composition teeters wonderfully towards chaos, but its capacious and flexible structure never quite succumbs. New figures flow in <clears throat> from stage right, poised to join the proceedings. And in the distance, over and across the canal, other relations, other worlds open up. Turned inward on their emotions, the figures are always also turning outward, populating space. Pictorial composition emerges here less as a system of fixed bonds than as an, an atmosphere of potential affinities. And as so often in his campaigns of close looking, Ruskin proceeded visually as much as verbally here. <clears throat> Standing before the painting in the summer of 1859, he pictured its relation at least twice. One sketch picks out key members of the family group at large, staging a number of the effects I've been drawing out of his published description, including that sensational little dog, haloed here in black. A further study proves even more arresting, haunting, I think. It depicts the face of the black-eyed boy hugging the column, his father's darling. Of course, Ruskin should fix on him so intently. The figure is magnetic in all the ways his verbal description conveys. But he also comes to serve as a locus of darker feeling in that description, lingering just around the edges of the prose. The boy, recall, is evidently his father's darling, for Veronese has put him full in light in the front, 
and given him a beautiful white silken jacket barred with black that nobody may ever miss seeing him to the end of time. His painted figure needed to be seen to the end of time because the boy himself would sooner or later be gone. Among other things, the painting constitutes a proleptic memorial for the boy. Death, one realizes, had not only haunted the painting's historical position on the razor's edge of Venetian decline, it had made itself felt here, too, in the complex of feeling condensed in a body standing close to us. Ruskin's copy of the figure registers something of this fragility and fear, but again in a different key. Look, for instance, at the play of dark forms beside his face on the left-hand side of the picture, bringing it into focus. There's something troubling, anxious, perhaps even slightly demonic about their lack of discipline, as if shadow itself has come to life. The erratic highlights they compete with on, what, on ear and forehead and cheekbone <clears throat> only add to the sense of things going perhaps slightly awry. Tender as they are, the features of the face seem to undergo a process of discoordination the longer one looks at them, between the eyes, for instance, around the shaping of the mouth, where further shadows gather. These are subtle effects, to be sure, creeping up slowly on the viewer. But once seen, I think, they never fully go away. Their purpose remains mysterious, but darkly enlivening. If the boy's stare might be mistaken for blank, it also reveals itself to be full of relational feeling. It is as if the drawing itself, even as it sought to fix and work through whatever Ruskin had located in the figure on its own, acknowledged that such isolation could only be deforming. And perhaps those animate shadowy forms mean to return us finally to the figure's situation within a, within a wider painterly syntax his being there with others, who or whatever they are. The boy hovers, almost dances, at the picture's edge as he climbs around the column, bridging his family and the Madonnas, but also bridging the painting space and our own. We stand together with him at the threshold of another world. Ruskin's attitudes to Renaissance art would continue to develop over the 1860s and 70s. In his epilogue to the 1883 edition of Modern Painters II, he claimed that it was left to me and to me alone first to discern and then to teach, so far as in this hurried century any such thing can be taught, the excellency and supremacy of five great painters, despised until I spoke of them, Turner, Tintoret, Luini, Botticelli, and Carpaccio. By 1860, Ruskin's engagement with the first two names, <clears throat> Turner and Tintoret, on this rather eccentric list were well known. But Luini, Botticelli, Carpaccio, these were unexpected discoveries occupying Ruskin for the next 15 years of his career. In different ways, all three of them represented further shifts in his understanding of Renaissance art as he attempted to take the measure of this moment of socio-cultural transition in finer detail and more nuanced terms. By the early 1870s, during his tenure as Oxford's first slave professor of fine art, he was exploring the relation between what he called in a kind of shorthand, Gothic and Greek artistic sensibilities, not as straightforwardly opposed cultural regimes, but is making up curious, the curiously mixed conditions of art making within early Renaissance culture, Greek and Gothic, in other words, at once. Key moments of artistic practice in the years surrounding 1500 came for him to embody a dynamic tension between what he took to be classical and medieval qualities of spirit and style. The rigid dichotomy between medieval health and high Renaissance corruption already so troubled by his engagements with Tintoretto and Veronese, now developed into a description of strange temporal hybridity, modes of painting that were pagan and Christian, early and late, ancient and modern, all at once. In this evolution of his thought, the North Italian painter Bernardino Luini served a crucial transitional role. 
Ruskin first began to study Luini seriously in 1862, visiting the churches and galleries of Milan. A large, strange copy made over several weeks of that summer, showing the figure of Saint Catherine from a fresco in the church of Maurizio al um, Monastero Maggiore, please forgive my Italian, <clears throat> speaks to the intensity of his investments. Um, and just to give a sense of the size of this thing, um, uh, here it is, sorry for the selfie, but, but here I am um, kind of studying it in, in um, I guess, 2022. Um, but just a, it's sort of, I'm like six foot one. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a large drawing, um, sort of very kind of intensely worked. <clears throat> so this is kind of one measure I think of his investments um, and their intensity. Another measure and, and also a measure of the conditions in which a drawing like this one was made can be found in the correspondence of the painter, Edward Byrne Jones, who was employed by Ruskin uh, to make his own copies from the Milan frescoes at this time. And this is Byrne Jones. I am drawing from a fresco that has never been seen since the days it was painted in jet darkness, in a chapel where candlesticks, paper flowers, and wooden dolls abound freely. Ruskin, by treacherous smiles and winning courtesies and delicate tips, has wheedled the very candlesticks off the altar for my use. And I draw every day now by the light of eight altar, altar candles. Also, a fat man stands at the door and says the church is shut if anybody comes. And when the priest himself put his head in, the fat man said, hush, and frightened the poor priest away. All this effort was expanded on trying to bring into clearer view the achievement of an artist that Ruskin <clears throat> wished to rescue from his shadowy reputation at the time as a hanger on um, in the circle of Leonardo da Vinci during uh, Leonardo's years in Milan. Little else at the time was known, but in his lectures of 1863, later collected under the title The Cestus of Aglaia, Ruskin sought to shift the tide. Because, he writes, Leonardo made models of machines, dug canals, built fortifications, and dissipated half his art power in capricious ingenuities, we have many anecdotes of him, but no picture of importance on canvas, and only a few withered stains of one upon a wall. An astonishing judgment of the, of the last summer, uh, last supper that, withered stains of one upon a wall. But, he goes on, because his pupil or reputed pupil, uh, Luini, labored in constant and successful simplicity, we have no anecdotes of him, only hundreds of noble works. Luini is perhaps the best central type of the highly trained painter, Italian painter. He is the only man who entirely, entirely united the religious temper, which was the spirit life of art, with the physical power of its bodily life. He joins the purity and passion of Angelico to the strength of Veronese. He is a man 10 times greater than Leonardo, and Luini has left nothing behind him that is not lovely, that is not lovely. The wonderful jibes against Leonardo aside, Ruskin's imagine, uh, Ruskin imagines here a kind of balance between religious temper and physical power it provided a model for the accounts of his favorite painters, of favorite painters, excuse me, he would go on to write in the 1870s. It laid the groundwork for the relation that I began to introduce between Greek and Gothic sensibilities that would emerge in his Oxford lectures and related texts. For the sake of um, time, unfortunately, I have to pass over Carpaccio today. Although if you haven't ever read um, had the chance to read Ruskin on Carpaccio, I'd strongly recommend it. It's the, the, his kind of comments on the artist make up some of his loveliest and most involving pages of art criticism, I think. <clears throat> so not time for Carpaccio, but I do want to address um, Ruskin's investments in Sandro Botticelli. Although the uh, so-called rediscovery of Botticelli had only recently got underway when Ruskin turned to the artist, um, he was in fact far from alone in his enthusiasm, despite his own claims. Ruskin um, himself at first relied on a text by the younger critic, 
Walter Pater, first published in 1870, going so far as to read aloud from it in his initial lectures on the artist. He would soon be critical of that text, but um, initially he was quite taken with it. Both Ruskin and Pater focused on what they took to be Botticelli's hybrid cultural identity and his trans-historical significance. For Pater, Botticelli's painting provided for modern viewers, and I quote, a more direct inlet into the Greek temper than the works of the Greeks themselves, connecting the present to the past. For Ruskin, Botticelli was, he said, a reanimate Greek, one who received classical learning as a native element of his being. He was, Ruskin says, the only painter of Italy who understood the thoughts of heathens and Christians equally and could in a measure paint both Aphrodite and the Madonna. Botticelli, he says, is uh, in 1874, in one of these Oxford lectures, is perfect in the life of the nobly natural world. He is the only painter of all the religious schools who unites every bodily with every spiritual power and knowledge. He only can delight in every earthly and material beauty and enforce every law without the least taint possess passing over him. So the echoes of Ruskin's earlier account of Luini here, I think are very clear. And in light of them, one might wish to understand the critics efforts to balance competing historical forces and figures like Botticelli as some attempt at synthetic resolution between Greek and Gothic claims, however uneasy. Except that in practice, the interplay between these terms would never settle down in Ruskin's writings. Greek and Gothic are set in constant dialectical motion in his lectures, attributes of one mode migrating to the other with such dizzy dizzying frequency that one begins to wonder whether such complexity itself might now make up the very essence of art's most powerful claims. For in great art, Ruskin tells his Oxford audience in 1870, modes of outright opposition are always inlaid in complex. And here, this, we're entering some kind of tangled territory here, but bear with me. <clears throat> Thus, he writes, uh, you know, in your study of sculpture, we saw that the essential claim, central aim, excuse me, of the Greek art was tranquil action. The chief aim of Gothic art was passionate rest, a peace, an eternity of intense sentiment. As I go into detail, I shall continue, continually therefore have to oppose Gothic passion, ecstasis, to Greek temperance, yet Gothic rigidity, stasis, to Greek action and eleutheria, uh, freedom. You see how doubly, how intimately opposed the ideas are, yet how difficult to explain without apparent contradiction. Well, indeed, in the depictive arts, this new form of the Gothic is both static and ecstatic, visionary, passionate, and fantastic in purpose, he writes, but also in method, trenchantly formal and clear. The Greek, meanwhile, is full of action and freedom, but also dependent on its respect for limits. It's absolutely realistic, temperate, and simple in purpose, yet in method, mysterious and soft, sometimes licentious, sometimes terrific, always obscure. So far, so confusing perhaps, but examples are called for and Ruskin quickly obliges. In 1870, he offers this comparison to his audience, uh, a Greek dancing girl, which is from a terracotta beside this Madonna, of Philippa Lippis, he says, Greek motion against Gothic absolute quietness, Greek indifference, dancing careless against Gothic passion, the mother's what word can I use except frenzy of love, Greek fleshliness against hungry wasting of the self-forgetful body, Greek softness of diffused shadow and ductile curve against Gothic sharpness of crystalline color and acuteness of angle, and so on. The oppositions continue. Now, I will be the first to suggest that Ruskin's choice of Lippi here as epitome of the Gothic doesn't fully square with the qualities that he adduces. It takes some work, I think, to see hungry wasting of the self-forgetful body in the Madonna, 
or even her frenzy of love. Though perhaps one can discern similar, less extreme versions of these qualities in the painting. And even this imperfect match might interest us. It's as if for Ruskin in 1870, this new idea of the Gothic he was developing had still to be uncovered from within the image rather than offering itself immediately on its surface. If the Madonna fails to fully satisfy, though, the dancer hits her mark. Ruskin's drawings of the statue offer various mutually enlivening points of view. She is all surface in this account, all externality, a sculptural drama of motion and shadow playing out as the draftman, draftsman moves around her form. The figure thus embodies aspects of the Greek that Ruskin understood to have also persisted into modernity. And here we come back to Bot Botticelli. In 1871, for instance, Botticelli's great mystic nativity in London's National Gallery is seen to offer, he says, a quite perfect example of what the masters of the pure Greek school did in Florence. This includes an aversion, he thinks, to the face as depicted in his dancing girl. One of the Greek main characters, you know, is to be aprosopos, faceless, he says. <clears throat> and I continue the quotation. If you look first at the faces in this picture, you will find them ugly, often without expression, always ill or carelessly drawn. The entire purpose of the picture is a mystic symbolism by motion and chiaroscuro instead, by motion first. There is a dome of burning clouds in the upper heaven. Twelve angels half float, half dance in a circle round the lower vault of it. All their drapery is drifted so as to make you feel the whirlwind of their motion. They are seen by gleams of silvery or fiery light, relieved against an equally lighted blue of inimitable depth and loveliness. It is impossible for you ever to see a more noble work of passionate Greek chiaroscuro, rejoicing in the light. Ruskin's dancer takes her second turn in Botticelli's picture, an enchainment of radiating motion. And she returns again in 1874 in an almost feverish description of um, the Uffizi's great coronation of the Virgin with its choir, Ruskin says, of 12 angels, not dancing, not flying, but carried literally in a whirl or vortex, whirlwind of the breath of heaven. But crucially, Ruskin's attention immediately shifts uh, from this kind of whirlwind, fixing on a tiny figure he identifies as the angel Gabriel on the far side of the action, here in the very center of the, of the upper register. A face diminished by perspective and glimpsed through, he says, a close rain of golden rays. Across his face, Ruskin says, between you and him fall straight bars of this golden rain, like the base of a helmet visor. Right down across his face, every edge of them as fine and true as a line of gossamer, but you think the face will be spoiled. It is as perfect as if no line crossed it. You see it as through a veil, tender, infinite in rejoicing, lifted in the light of the spirit, brighter than gold. Amidst the dancing Greek bodies then, there's a figure of Gothic stasis and Gothic ecstasy, a half veiled face pinioned by bands of gold where all motion comes to a stop. Whirlwind and still face. These are now the poles of Ruskin's visual attention, describing an almost rhythmic oscillation between fixation and flow, perpetually fanning out from a still center only to come back again. The rays of gold across, across Gabriel's face are that radiation materialized. One final moment of attention allows me to move towards a conclusion. Happily, it may evoke the early days of the Ruskin Art Club itself with its focus on the technical and historical aspects of engraving. <clears throat> For in, Rusk in 1872, Ruskin delivered a series of lectures on engraving at Oxford later to be published under the title Ariadne Florentina. They culminate in an extraordinary treatment of a group of early Florentine prints dating to the 1470s, uh, depicting the prophetic sibyls of classical mythology, 
which Ruskin understood, understood to be works designed by Botticelli himself. Um, modern scholars don't agree with this. Um, I'm just showing the, the um, sort of current agreed attribution um, on the screen, Baccio Baldini, um, you know, which is, which is a guess still on scholars' part, an informed guess. Um, but whoever made these, it's, it's also clear, moved in the same circles as, as Botticelli. So Ruskin wasn't too far off. In any case, the authorship isn't what matters here. Um, Ruskin's title for the lectures, Ariadne Florentina, was meant to evoke Theseus's dark trials in the Cretan labyrinth of Greek mythology, as well as the maiden Ariadne trapped at its heart. The maze of Daedalus was much on Ruskin's mind during these years, an ambivalent figure for him, suggesting at once ornamental pleasure and technological threat. <clears throat> Other texts of this moment gather instance after instance of its depiction almost obsessively from ancient coins to more modern survivals as on the portico of Luca's cathedral on the right here, or in prints more closely related to his lectures. The figure of the labyrinth thus mediates between Greek and Gothic sensibilities for Ruskin. And in his uh, discussion of the Hellespontic Sibyl, especially the spirit of prophecy and old age, he describes her, anxious questions of historical identity and transmission come to the fore. Ruskin focuses on the withered tree trunks of her throne, treating them as a kind of epigraphic sign. In the throne's weird characters, he says, you have the best example I can show of the orders of decorative design, which are especially expressible by engraving, and which belong to a group of art instincts scarcely now to be understood, much less recovered. The instincts, namely for the arrangement of pure line and labyrinthine intricacy through which the grace of order may give continual clue. That phrase weird characters intimates a kind of language of line. But if such a language once existed, it does no longer. It is foreign to us, a relic of art instincts scarcely now to be understood. To look at it in the present is not to read a meaningful sequence of signs, but to trace a graphic image of loss. The entire body, he goes on, of ornamental design connected with writing in the Middle Ages seems as if it were a sensible symbol to the eye and brain of the methods of error and recovery, the minglings of crooked with straight, which constitute the great problem of human morals and fates. fate. And when I chose my title, I hoped to have justified it by careful analysis of the methods of labyrinthine ornament, which made sacred by Theseian traditions and beginning in imitation of physical truth with the spiral waves of the waters of Babylon as the Assyrian carved them, entangled in their returns the eyes of men on Greek vase and Christian manuscript till they closed in the arabesques which sprang round the last luxury of Venice and Rome. That's all a single sentence. We cover a lot of ground there. In the first part of this extraordinary and expansive passage, ornament embodies the, continual, the continuous dilemmas of lived morality, a sensible symbol, he says, of human fate. But then the figure's twisting lines become fully temporal somehow, describing a slow unfolding process of elaboration, luxuriance, and decline. Astonishingly, this labyrinth of ornament traces a whole world historical trajectory of survival and variation encompassing both Greek and Gothic form. Yet, just as striking, Ruskin defers the full telling of this story, perhaps defers it forever. He only hoped to have justified his title, he says, but he goes on, the labyrinth of life itself and its more and more interwoven occupation become too manifold and too difficult for me. And of the time wasted in the blind lanes of it, perhaps that spent in analysis or recommendation of the art to which men's present conduct makes them insensible has been chiefly cast away. Here, um, 
movingly, we enter the present tense of Ruskin's own experience in the 1870s, a time of sadness into which modernity has encroached too far. The fatal arabesques of Renaissance luxury are finally closing in. The labyrinth has been absorbed, uh, has absorbed him, excuse me, into its blind lanes. And Ruskin comes disturbingly close here to negating his entire career long project of interpretive recovery. He stages not so much the immediacy of aesthetic experience as the implacable otherness of the forms he loves, a mode of figuration which can only be entered into or expressed by allowing his own critical authority to stand in ruins. And yet, as we have already seen in relation to Tintoretto, out of those ruins, utterly crushed to earth, new modes of imagination might nonetheless emerge. Ruskin gives no hint of that renovation here. Everything is only potential in this darkness with no clear sign of dawn. But we might turn back to Ruskin's own earlier considerations of what the Gothic really was in all of its uncertainty. In that most famous chapter of the Stones of Venice on the nature of Gothic, Ruskin made clear that a quality he called changefulness lay at the Gothic's very heart. It is, he writes, that strange disquietude of the Gothic spirit that is its greatness, that restlessness of the dreaming mind that wanders hither and thither among the niches and flickers feverishly across the, around the pinnacles and frets and fades and labyrinthine knots and shadows along wall and roof, and yet is not satisfied nor shall be satisfied. The Greek could stay in his triglyph furrow and be at peace, but the work of the Gothic heart is fretwork still, and it can neither rest in nor from its labor, but must pass on sleeplessly until its love of change shall be pacified forever. The Gothic then constituted an art of radical incompletion. Death might mark an arbitrary ending but art's love of change would never be done. It couldn't be pinned down to this or that specific instance of form because the Gothic was in essence an, insati an insatiable will to form. Always patterning itself after the old, it also was always opening onto the new. If this recalls everything that can be so destabilizing and confusing in Ruskin's traffic with the visual, it also takes us to everything that is so heartening in it. Too. Restless and unsatisfied, the lines of the Gothic heart enfold into the present, um, ready for us to take them up. Fret works still. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for helping illuminate for us Ruskin's views on the Renaissance. There was a tremendous amount to take in and process over the past hour, uh, not the least of which was some of Ruskin's labyrinthine paragraph long sentences unpacking his views. Um, now it should, it should probably go without saying that during Ruskin's time, it was trickier to experience art firsthand or secondhand like we can, do, like we can today. Um, so his knowledge of an artist's oeuvre may have been less complete than what an art history student can easily find today at the click of a mouse. I'll, I'll let other people talk about that. I, I, I don't really know. Um, but we're going to open um, this up for some questions. And I'll start this off and uh, with a question of my own. Before I do, I'll just mention that I completely understand Ruskin's, uh, how he came, turned around on Veronese. Um, when I first came across Veronese's uh, Feast in the House of Levi in the Academia in Venice. I spent two hours just staring at it. I mean, it was just, it's its hard to take it all in. And number one, it's monumental. I mean, it's like the, the width of a room, of, an, of a large room. And it, it is just so impressive to see. You kind of like go up to it and then come back and then you sit down and you just, like your mind is just exploding while looking at it. Um, so uh, Jeremy, I'll, I'll just start this off with a pretty basic question. What's what is Ruskin's dividing line for Gothic versus Renaissance art? I noticed that um, Filippo Lippi is cons was considered Gothic by Ruskin, 
Um, I always thought these days he was considered a more transitional figure of the early Renaissance. I'm, when it comes to Gothic, I'm thinking Chima Bui, um, Giotto, Masaccio, Paolo Cello. Those seem to be more traditionally oh. considered goth uh, Italian Gothic artists. Um, so why don't we um, just start there and we can then open it up to other people if you want to take a stab at that. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I mean, yeah, you're right. It's sort of, it's a, it's a very kind of um, uh, unfamiliar sort of use of the Gothic, this sort of um, the term Gothic that he kind of starts to undertake in the in the 1870s. And um, I think it partly needs to be sort of understood as, well, in the, in the way that he could, I mean, in some ways, you know, this is a, this whole kind of lecture is about changing one's mind, you know, and kind of Ruskin changing his mind. And just as he could kind of change his mind and kind of come to see the achievement of artists that um, maybe at first, early on in his career, he, he couldn't see um, or couldn't appreciate. Um, so um, he could, I think, change his mind or sort of enrich um, what he meant by some of these kind of um, cornerstone concepts that he developed, like, like the Gothic. Um, so um, one of the things that happens in the 1870s in these um, um, Oxford lectures, um, you know, that he's kind of giving uh, term after term um, teaching there, uh, is that he starts to experiment with using the terminology of the Gothic to talk about uh, what you're kind of rightly pointing out to as early Renaissance art. Um, so, it, so it starts to become useful for him to use that terminology um, in relation to artists like uh, Filippo Lippi, um, Botticelli, um, and, and other kind of mainly sort of Florentine artists of, of the years around um, 1500. Um, but he sort of, but part of that kind of um, enrichment or development of the terminology of the Gothic is it's um, sort of being paired with um, this kind of wild idea of the Greek, right? Um, and, um, and by that, he sort of means um, both the ancient Greek and the kind of um, uh, the sort of revived Greek, right, of the Renaissance. Um, the, the Renaissance, of course, being, you know, um, having kind of rebirth, uh, the notion of rebirth in its, in its very name, um, and a kind of um, return of, um, of pagan antiquity. Um, so, um, in a, in, in a way that kind of early on, he seems to have been interested in just like, uh, putting that to one side, you know, that aspect of things, um, he starts to come, come to grips with it really, um, starting in the 1860s, I think in relation to Luini, uh, and then kind of into the 1870s and the sort of more, um, uh, intricate and sort of, um, difficult, unstable, but interesting ways, I hope. Uh, I find them interesting anyway, that I was um, sort of talking about. Um, so in some ways, um, just to kind of get back to your, your baseline question, um, it, it becomes a sort of movable um, chronological point for him, you know, um, that, uh, and, it, and it becomes less about sort of literal chronology than a kind of, um, than some sort of, um, uh, quality or sort of mode of imagination and art art making that that is sort of um, temporally movable in some ways. Um, yeah, I mean, you you certainly notice that in in Gothic art, um, it is mostly religious, right? I mean, there's uh, you you don't get a lot of non-religious uh, artwork, and even uh, like the patrons will be tucked away in the corner somewhere rather than. Um, maybe later on in Renaissance art, where they take a slightly more um, a prominent uh, place of, uh, of, of and I get, maybe that's for Ruskin, sort of the dividing line in between the focus on the um, the divine in Gothic art versus maybe the focus more on on mankind and and his vanities. Um, that maybe that's or maybe that's part yeah. of his dividing line. 
No, I think that's, yeah, I, no, I think that's right. And, and I mean, you know, what makes it so difficult is that um, he, and he knows that he's being slightly outrageous in, in doing this. Um, he'll take a, a kind of famously, um, extremely sort of um, fervently religious picture like uh, Botticelli's mystic nativity, um, you know, which is sort of um, made when Botticelli is under the kind of complete spell of, um, of the great preacher Savonarola uh, in Florence, right? So this kind of um, classic almost, um, well, the Florentine version of evangelical painting essentially. Um, and he, uh, um, he describes it as Greek, right? Um, and and uh, he, he sort of really wants you to, um, be kind of taken aback um, or sort of, and, and really have to, well, what is Greek about this? What, could, what on earth can he mean um, by the kind of Greek qualities of these sort of angels spinning in the sky? Um, and um, how does that kind of make us rethink what we mean by the Greek and what it, we mean by the Gothic and, and so forth? Um, so there's a kind of, um, intensely kind of ex exploratory uh, kind of experimental spirit um, in in these in these lectures that's um, that's uh, that can be quite exciting but also you know confusing great thanks uh, does anybody else want to have a question if they want to uh, looks like Gabriel is yep. first and you can also use your uh, you can raise your hand with uh, the under um, uh, uh, if you click on reactions down at the bottom of your screen, just so that we keep this civil yeah. and orderly. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think uh, one of the the uh, the virtues of the lecture, Jeremy, for me was that uh, it's you know it's it's often that we hear uh, that Ruskin does art criticism until eighteen sixty, and then with unto this last, we're into political economy and this and social issues. Uh, and art falls to the side. And while there's a certain a certain way in which Ruskin loses his faith in art as a uh, you know a means of of communicating the message, uh, and certainly goes through many uh, changes in his rhetorical style, it's 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 worth and it, it, that I thought that was so significant about what you uh, uh, about this lecture was to indicate that the art criticism continues. Mm. Uh, after 1860 and deepens actually and, and there's and some of the most interesting things about Ruskin's thought uh, are come with the evolutions uh in the art criticism after 1860 particularly in the in the uh slate uh during his time as slave you know professor so I I you know I think that's that's always you know worth underlining that uh, it's not it's not quite as neat as we uh, often try to uh uh, uh, to, to project it. The other thing, which which I you know I'll always love when anyone talks about Ruskin's art criticism, it, the passages that you chose, many of them really focus on that methodology of Ruskin of finding the detail mm -hmm. in the in the iconography, which reveals everything. Uh, and uh, while not all of Ruskin's uh, you know, uh, the discoveries are 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 necessarily persuasive. Uh, they're always uh, remarkable, and they always get us to see the painting in a whole new way. So uh, that was a. That's it's always great to you know to revisit those passages where he finds this. He finds the donkey, and he finds uh, the dog uh, in the painting. A kind of unlikely, uh, un an unlikely illuminating detail. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely agree um, on, with kind of both both of those points. Um, um, yeah, the sort of <clears throat> things that are so interesting in the treatment of art after after 1860. And um, yeah, as you say, kind of particularly in the Oxford lectures, but also, of course, in those uh, extraordinary moments of, of kind of art criticism or sort of uh, description <clears throat> that happen in something like um, Forest Clavigera. Mm. Uh, 
and uh, you know, if if like we had another hour, um, which would really have tried your patience, I think, but um, we could have spent a long time with um, you know his extraordinary description of um, Carpaccio's dream of Saint Ursula uh, in in yeah. um, uh, I think it's the twentieth letter of of fours and um and the way in which he kind of tries to integrate that extraordinary description into um uh, a kind yeah. of um sort of social critique right that he's carrying on elsewhere in, in the <laughs> so there's this kind of amazing kind of continuity between the art criticism and the and the kind of uh uh social thought um and uh, yeah, I also kind of um, find so kind of, not just like winning and attractive, but like um, moving this sort of commitment to the particular in Ruskin, this kind of turning to the detail. And, um, and also there's a kind of, um, for me, <laughs> sort of, it's, almost, it's never kind of showy. There's a kind of humility about his sort of um, attentiveness um, to the to these um, um, moments, passages of painting that um, that that really kind of models um, for me anyway a, a, a mode of attending to a work of art. It's cer it certainly kind of changed the way in which I proceed as an art historian very much. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't know. I I love it too. And um, and the kind of thinking with particulars that he can do is is quite extraordinary. Elena, um, you've got your hand up and please unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, what a marvelous lecture. It was just every moment was captivating <laughs> as <laughs> both you and Ruskin hand in hand. Um, so I just, a couple of things, yeah, that, in relation to what you're talking about detail, um, I'll just mention this as a little bit of an aside here, but I was I was captivated by the, um, in the uh, nativity scene, um, you know, you talk, I think it was Ruskin that talks about the, it was either Ruskin or you who talked about the motion in Chioscuro. And, mm. and I noticed that there were crowns falling from mm. the angels there were there were there were like three crowns in the sky falling and then and then similarly um in Botticelli's painting with, with the um with faith and and hope and um I noticed I kept looking at faith's cup mm. it's a beautiful sort of translucent empty cup that seems to be quite central in the painting and I you know that caught my attention but but more so what I wanted to mention was I throughout your lecture and both you and Ruskin talk about you you talk about the movable chronology and and there's a lot of mention about transition Tintoretto's hmm. animality the narrative of time um, particularly the dynamic meaning um and the feeling is formed, the dynamic tension, the reanimate, the reanimate Greek. Um, and um, of course, feeling is the form. And then, and then particularly disquietude in you know, his nature of Gothic, his mention of disquietude and the love of change. And to me, that was a really important through line throughout, in terms of in in what I I'm as a poet assuming was one one of the reasons he chose that was the because the transition between the Greek and and um, between the Gothic and and the Renaissance um, seems to be the, the the important part for him. It's it's like you know it's that temporality and it's and it's also that that connection that is never severed. You know those those transitions. We all, you know, sometimes we want to separate all these different, you know, um, periods of of whether it's history or art, and but it's the transitions that are so fascinating too. Um, so for me, that was what really caught my attention, and I appreciate that. Yeah. No. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, the I'll just kind of um, put the put the the falling crowns back up on the screen. Uh, <laughs> For, for a moment. Um, yeah, uh, quite an extraordinary moment in the, in this painting. And um, mm -hmm. 
and kind of staging this sort of um, movement, but also um, of course a kind of, um, right, a kind of change um, or a kind of temporality that's sort of unfolding within the picture itself, which is, which is really interesting. But yeah, I mean, this is something I really respond to in Ruskin um, uh, as well. There, and, you know, there's a way in which um, some, re you know, some readers of Ruskin, often kind of hostile readers of Ruskin, have wanted to sort of emphasize um, the, his kind of bossiness and sort of strictness and his um, uh, kind of rigidity um, as uh, the rigidity of his taste and the rigidity of his thought. And kind of, uh, you know, actually, well, it, it'll be news to no one. Uh, <laughs> I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but but actually it's, it's what's so amazing about it is its dynamism, is its kind of, its own sort of changefulness um, its um, ability to kind of develop, develop and sort of riff on ideas um, uh, in uh, as they kind of unfold in the moment, um, and uh, again, also that kind of capacity, not just sort of to change, but to be changed, um, to kind of encounter something new, like Tintoretto, and to be bowled over by it, and not to know exactly what to do with it. At first, but um, but to sort of um, but to have you know as I was putting it the kind of the the courage of his responses you know he yeah. sort of he knows it's amazing uh, he knows it doesn't fit uh, and therefore um, he has to kind of adjust things so that it can fit right um, th this is a kind of extraordinary um, quality and it's one I think that. Um, of his mind, and it's one that sort of he keeps with him, really throughout his whole whole career, um, even in the kind of cranky final years. Uh, there is this kind of openness to to the new and to change that is um, remarkable and needs to be kind of I think spoken up for a bit uh, in the face of an insistence on uh, his kind of um, you know fuddy duddyish love of the old. Well, I, to me, it's, a, and again, not to make it, you know, not to br bring it full force into where we are now, but I mean, I see that so much of this as being a function of, of the arts, as being a function of, of poetry and film, particularly, and, and, and you know, that, that passionate rest that um, is talked about as well, you know, that's something that you would describe when describing a great actor that withholds the emotion, but, but it's still visible. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that that is, uh, timeless, you know? So again, we're, we're talking about that, you know, sort of, um, te temporal experience, but anyway, yes, yeah, so much to talk about here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kohler, you're up next. I, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for your campaign of, uh, of close looking, a beautiful phrase. And uh, I, I was uh, a wonderful to have your close look at Ruskin. Uh, you mentioned the drawing teacher being along with him in Venice. And I'm wondering, do, what do we know about that teacher's influence on Ruskin's close looking at this time? It, does, he, does he talk about it? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah, so so uh, J D Harding um, was a kind of um, um, a leading sort of watercolorist um, of of his day. Um, he was he was among kind of several um, sort of uh, teachers artists that um, Ruskin apprenticed apprenticed himself to when he was um, you know learning um, learning to draw. Um, and um, maybe Harding is kind of the most important to him. Um, it's certainly the one that he kind of um, retrospectively talked the most um, about. Um, when you look at um, Harding's uh, work, it's, it's sort of, um, it's very, very different than, than Ruskin's own drawings. Um, and and um, 
uh, this is something I myself am kind of trying to learn more about, um, sort of what it what it was actually that he sort of um, why Harding, you know, why um, why was he sort of wanting to study with this? Um, I mean, he was a you know very skilled draftsman, um, but um, you know Ruskin's own um, capacities as an artist led him in very sort of different directions um, from what what um, Harding undertook. I mean, maybe that was some of it, maybe it was kind of um, Harding gave him a kind of baseline that he could then sort of uh, react against as, as, as um, a draftsman. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very intriguing question and, and, and I wish I had a more sort of uh, <laughs> complete answer for you, but, um, but it, it's interesting in that, in that, um, anecdote, isn't it? That sort of, um, he emphasized the kind of, he brings Harding into it in order to sort of, um, so Harding is kind of feels crumbled up and elsewhere, um, in a passage I didn't quote, um, Harding before um, Tintoretto feels um, whipped like a schoolboy. Uh, and uh, and that's the kind of language, of course, that Ruskin himself would take up, but he uses it there um, to contrast his own sort of reaction to, uh, to, to Tintoretto, right? Whereas, whereas kind of um, Harding feels just like defeat Ruskin feels kind of crushed to earth, but also sort of enlivened, you know, also kind of excited by by Tintoretto. And uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe there's something there about the kind of difference between these figures too. Sort of like guitarists' reactions, differing reactions to Jimi Hendrix back in the day. It's either yeah, I'm giving way, up yeah. or, or I'm, or I'm going to practice harder. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we try to keep these to about 90 minutes, so maybe one last question, Bernard. And then uh, Gabriel, I know you want to follow up with uh, some news about upcoming events as well. Bernard. Uh, may I speak? Oh, yeah. I do not have a question, but I wish to express my gratitude um, to uh, the lecturer today, because um, I... I have come to uh, Ruskin from the perspective, his literary perspective and uh, that of political theory. It is not until now, however, that I've realized that I need to look at him as a, a from his perspective as regards art. He, he and the professor here have woken me to the need to be able to learn how to see and that that is done by by learning how how to draw, and going from that to to learning how to see, and I I, I want to express my gratitude that 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 you've opened my eyes to all of this. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. That's a very kind comment. Thank you. I just I just wanted to point out that um, Ted had put a comment in the chat. Um, we first started. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see yeah. that. No, just saying that um, William Morris doesn't allow Ruskin's art criticism to fall away by taking it up in his Kelmscott press work in the 1890s. And I think um, you know that's that's an important observation too. So thank, thanks for that, Ted. I want to make mm -hmm. sure we we got that into the discussion also. Yeah. No. Thank. Yeah. It's a it's an it's Sarah. an absolutely point. Yeah. But before I do announcements, I'd like to see if there's any. Any other questions? This has been such a such a fruitful discussion. Um, Ted, do you have any 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 other comments? Oh gosh, no. Just um, abundant thanks, Jeremy, mm -hmm. for uh, opening our eyes uh, to uh, to these uh, important works in the context of Ruskin. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. It's my yeah. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I wanted to just say the same. I really enjoyed this very much. And and the, the images that you brought as well, I mean, to be able to look at them, the quality of those images is, is great. And to be able to look at them so closely and talk about them and and see them, you know, and, and do that kind of close scenes that you're talking about, which is what Ruskin is all about. Mm. Um, it just enriched your lecture so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I would want to add my, my uh, comment too, Jeremy, my thanks. Um, 
not only a, le a, a fine lecture about Ruskin, but a Ruskinian lecture. <laughs> a lecture in which the very method that you used was Ruskinian. So, uh, so uh, double double insights there. So uh, well, that's the yeah, that's the highest compliment of all, I think, <laughs> in some ways. Great, great. Um, I'd also like to to thank to thank, uh, of course, Sarah and Tyson for shepherding us this morning, and for Joseph uh, for his uh, tech help. Um, just a very quick announcement. Um, oh, by the way, my name is Gabriel Meyer. I'm the executive director of the Ruskin Art Club. I, you know, just sort of come in at the end of these presentations and this strange figure who appears and, and uh, gives announcements. So I do have an announcement to make. Um, uh, next month, we will have our annual Ruskin birthday bash. Uh, at the Telescope Studio in LA's downtown uh, Arts District. This is always a great event, great, great fun event. This will be in person and also on Zoom. Uh, Sunday, February the 11th. So it's a Sunday afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, uh, in person, as I said, and also on Zoom at the Telescope uh, Studio. The event will feature uh, Robert, Robert Hewison's fine 2019 film uh, um, a tribute to Ruskin with actor Michael Palin reading excerpts from Preteritae. It's a beautiful, a beautiful little uh, film. And then our our old friend cellist uh, Alan Hahn will be performing a new work uh, for cello and piano. Uh, so there'll be a lot, a lot to uh, in, in that event. And for those who are there, a reception. Uh, following. So please uh, join us for our annual Ruskin birthday bash uh, on uh, this year on February 11th. I also want to bring to your attention probably the major event of 2024, uh, which is a conference in, in October, October 4th, 5th, and 6th uh, uh, on Friday and, well, actually 4th, 4th and 5th, fr uh, Friday and Saturday. Um, on r the theme, the very important theme, Ruskin in America. So the, the theme of the conference will be on Ruskin's influence on American art movements, on social movements, on utopian communities, on various American thinkers. Uh, so the uh, this will be, I think, an, it's, a, it's an important theme and one that we, um, we're... Uh, dedicating a great deal of time and attention to this year. So the Ruskin in America conference at USC uh, and on October 4th and 5th. So it'll be a keynote address on Friday night and a reception and then an all day Saturday uh, conference. So uh, there'll be a lot of information on our website as we, uh, as we get more details and as, uh, as we get further on during the year, but I wanted to bring uh, save the date, put this in your calendar, October 4th and 5th, uh, 2024, the Ruskin in America conference at USC. And thank you all for coming. This is a, a, a marvelous start to our year. So we, uh, we couldn't be doing better than this. So we're, uh, we're delighted and uh, we'll see you uh, at Ruskin's birthday bash. Thank you, everyone, so Thank much for being all. here. And thank you again, Jeremy. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thanks okay. for having me. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care. Bye-bye.